Welcome to Nicholas Hood III Ministries, a ministry of hope, spiritual inspiration, personal power guided by Christian love. May the power of God's Holy Spirit fall upon you as you sit back and enjoy today's program. I introduce you now to Pastor Nicholas Hood III. Today we begin the second in a three-part series on the book of Nehemiah. Last week, I talked about Nehemiah chapter 1, where he self-describes himself as a cupbearer to the king, the king of Persia. Today, I want to talk about chapter 2, because what happens in chapter 2 is Nehemiah has received the blessing of the king of Persia to go home to repair the walls. Two, the king of Persia has given him a letter of introduction for safe passage uh, to the countries between Persia and Jerusalem. But number three, the king of Persia gives Nehemiah an armed guard, two units, uh, cavalry and foot soldiers. And uh, with that, Nehemiah goes home. And he can go home. Not everybody is happy that Nehemiah is returning to Jerusalem to repair the walls. But it's a funny thing with that letter of passage from the king of Persia. Uh, Nehemiah uh, has basically a get out of jail card. Uh, and, and so he heads home. And when he goes home, the te text tells us that Nehemiah uh, for three days is in the city of Jerusalem. And he's weeping. Uh, he's weeping when he sees the gaps on the wall because he knows that in the gaps of the wall that uh, the city is defenseless. I, uh, but for three days, he doesn't say anything. He does not tell anybody that he's there. But for three days, he takes account of the condition of the walls of Jerusalem. Then, after the third day, Nehemiah gathers together a small contingent of men the Bible says just a few men. And he takes these men and they wait until the sun goes down. And when the sun goes down, Nehemiah and these handful of men get on horses. Uh, only a horse for themselves. They don't take any other beast. And they ride around the circumference of the walls of Jerusalem. And as they ride around, they take account obviously the weaknesses, but they also take account of the strengths. And they look at what they're seeing and they realize that even uh, with the destruction of the walls of Israel, the walls of Jerusalem, there are opportunities. Uh, but for every opportunity that they notice, there are also threats. And so Nehemiah, for three nights, uh, does this. And he surveys the walls, and he tries to figure out a plan of action. You know, I have friends in the business world who talk about SWOT analysis. And what they really mean is uh, whenever you analyze a situation, what are your strengths? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats? And this is what... Nehemiah does long before the modern business school. That's what he's doing. He's making a SWOT analysis. And what does he find? He finds, yes, the walls are torn down. Yes, there are gaping holes in the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, yes, the city is defenseless. But even though the city is defenseless, even though uh, it is a dangerous time for the people of Jerusalem. He feels that there are also strengths. And guess what some of the strengths were? What he realizes in his simple walk around the city is that one, a lot of the people who lived in Jerusalem lived within the walls and there were gaps in the walls right behind their houses. And so rather than ask every inhabitant of Jerusalem to just in mass uh, go to the walls uh, at any particular point of the walls, 
but rather what Nehemiah does is he organizes the people to fix the wall behind their house. I think, I think there's a story in this. He says, don't worry about the big picture. Just worry about your picture. Worry about the wall behind your house. And if you can fix the gap in the wall behind your house, and if you can fix the gap in the wall behind your house, and if you over there just fix the hole in the wall behind your house, when we finally put it all together, there won't be any gaps in the walls. And that's what they do. And I think that there's a lesson in this. And the lesson is that sometimes in life, we worry too much about the big picture. And sometimes we would be much better served, much better off, if we just worried about our own backyard. You know, when the snow falls, I, you know, I live in Michigan, and I know some people looking at this don't get much snow. But in Michigan, every now and then we get snow. And when the snow comes, uh, I don't worry about shoveling my neighbor's snow. I start with the snow in my own driveway. I, I, I start with the snow in my own sidewalk. Uh, but you know, there comes a time uh, if, you know, I, I remember years ago, shoveling my snow and having my sons help me to shovel the snow. Uh, but one of my neighbors had grown old and this was a self-sufficient guy. Uh, he was a minister, Reverend David Eberhard. He's now since gone on to glory. Uh, but Eberhard couldn't get out of his house because the snow was packed up against the storm door. And so what did I do? I had already finished my yard and my sidewalk. I asked my children to help me, and we dug Reverend Eberhard out. And the point that I'm making is you got to start somewhere. And in life, what Nehemiah realized was that there were strengths in, uh, even though in their weaknesses, the people were defenseless, but even in their defenselessness, uh, there was a certain strength. And I dare say that for those of you who are looking at this program today, you may be poor, you may be undereducated, you may be shut out of the mainstream of society, but no matter who you are, you have a strength. No matter who you are, you have a strength. I've been listening on the radio to the history, the 50th anniversary of hip hop uh, music. And one of the things, it, th this historical analysis on NPR uh, is showing is that the hip hop movement and the hip hop music really was born out of young people who didn't necessarily have the greatest musical training uh, young people who maybe felt shut out of society, uh, but they knew how to rap. And guess what? Where I haven't heard a lot of this in the analysis, but a lot of rap music, most of the rap music that I listen to, and I'm not a particularly a great aficionado of rap, but the one thing I've learned is that the greatest rap music and the top selling rap music all tells a story and it's poetry at its best. You know, some people may look down on it, but it's poetry. And these young, poor uh, men and women, young men and young women, figured out that if they couldn't write the music, they could sample the music from somebody else. Uh, and by putting it, by rapping on top of a soundtrack, uh, they made their own beats. They made their own uh, music and they put their own poems together with it and the lesson to me in, in Nehemiah uh, in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem is that he didn't try to get the people to do everything he just said let's start where we are the other thing is Nehemiah and the people of Israel uh, who were living in Jerusalem uh, they, re they loved their country they loved their city they loved the walls of Jerusalem so much that the people uh, listened to Nehemiah when he said, we're going to rebuild these walls. And we know that not everybody is happy with us rebuilding the walls. And so I'm going to ask you, on the one hand, to have the tools to rebuild the wall. But on the other hand, you got to have your sword. you got to have your shield. 
you've got to have the weapons to protect yourself. And in every life, uh, we have to make an analysis of what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are the threats uh, to my life? And what are the opportunities that are in front of me? And I tell you, Jesus Christ will show you strength where you don't see strength. Jesus Christ will take your weakness and make you strong. Jesus Christ will give you an opportunity and show you possibility where you can't see a thing. And at the same time, the spirit of the Holy Spirit will inform you when there's a threat that maybe you don't even see coming. I want you to stick around because in a few minutes, I'm gonna be talking with a great psychiatrist, Dr. Linda Hotchkiss, and we're gonna talk about Nehemiah and how he ascertained the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Stick around, and we'll be right back. This is a new ministry which is just starting. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and his power throughout the world. If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. We appreciate your support and in this way you can partner with Reverend Hood in sharing the good news of Jesus throughout the world. Please make your check out to Nicholas Hood III Ministries and mail it to 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Nick Hood, and with me today is Dr. Linda Hotchkiss, a psychiatrist, member of my church, and uh, I've asked her to uh, give her thoughts on Nehemiah. We're talking about Nehemiah surveying the walls of Jerusalem. And Dr. Hotchkiss, I want to thank you for being with me another week. And uh, what are your thoughts? I, I was just speaking to the uh, process that Nehemiah entertained in assessing the strengths, the weaknesses, the opportunities, and the threats in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And what does that tell you about Nehemiah? I think Nehemiah is, is very strategic. I think he, he looks at the whole picture, but also he looks at how can I put together a plan that will ensure that the entire wall is completed. He's strategic when he goes um, and he's there by himself for three days. You said he walked around, he looked, he wants to see it for himself. I think that's very smart for him to see it with his own eyes before he gets the reports from different people. Different people are going to tell him different things, but He's, he's seen it with his own eyes, so he knows how to analyze what, uh, what they're saying. And he also has in mind, okay, these are the resources I have. Um, I, I want to put it together. Uh, so I, I think he's very strategic. I also think he's strategic in that he realizes that even within the whole group, there are families or clans. And so he's thinking in his mind, how... How can I uh, get people to work for a common goal, but not be uh, fighting each other for the resources? And he comes up with, with a pretty interesting plan that you, that you mentioned. Um, each family or clan is building their own part of the wall. So they're, they're not fighting with each other, they're working together on their part uh, of the wall. They're not fighting each other for resources. And I think him walking around uh, uh, the first three days and, you know, analyzing the wall, analyzing the people that are there, very strategic on his part. Nehemiah, to me, seems like he's figured out that uh, in every weakness there's a strength, but also in every strength there's an element of weakness. And uh, the really successful people in life are the ones who are not necessarily always the strongest or the smartest, the fastest, but they're people who have learned how to utilize whatever they have to get to where they want to be. 
James Brown said it like this. It's not the greatest theological <laughs> message, but he did a song called Hot Pants. And he yes. said, she's got to use what she's got to get what she wants. And um, I don't know if there's a theology of James Brown, but, but in life, um, so often, we just have to start with the glass that we have in front of us, whether or not it's half full or half empty. Um, what other messages do you get from this story of how he analyzes the strengths and the weaknesses of Jerusalem and the people? Well, I think he is uh, very, very sensitive to the fact that the people have been um, uh, really afraid for their lives um, and now want security and safety. He's also sensitive to the fact that not everyone, not everyone around Jerusalem wants him to be successful. I think he is very, uh, very sensitive to that, which is why he's also saying to them, you know what, we're going to work on building this wall, but I also want you to have some weapons just in case something, uh, just in case something happens. Um, I think that uh, your point about in weaknesses, there are strengths and strengths, you know, there are sometimes weaknesses. What it makes me think about is uh, take somebody who is very well organized, for example. Someone can be, that can be a major strength, or if they're too organized, they may become too OCD, too controlling of other people. They want everything to be organized within an inch of its life. So sometimes a strength like that can, can can be uh, can go overboard, and you have to balance things out. Similarly, uh, I am reminded of of actually friends and family who either have ADHD or dyslexia, have had difficulty reading, um, but were interested in language and gifted with language, and so instead of having that be um, a, 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 a barrier, an obstacle for them, a weakness for them, their interest in language, they developed an extensive vocabulary um, and can uh, really educate other people, paint beautiful word pictures. And so what was a weakness in terms of, oh, maybe I read slow or letters are mixed up, their interest in language became a strength instead. Mm -hmm. I think about, uh, I think it was in the 80s when Muhammad Ali and George Foreman fought in a prize fight in Kinshasa, Zaire, mm -hmm. which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, many supporters of Ali were very concerned that he might get hurt. Not, they just assumed he might lose, but they were really concerned that he might be severely injured mm -hmm. by Foreman because Foreman was younger, mm -hmm. he was stronger, and he was a harder puncher. He had knocked out uh, Kenny Norton, he had knocked out uh, Joe Frazier mm -hmm. very rapidly. And, uh, you know, Ali uh, turned the tables on everybody, including Foreman. Uh, you know, he lasted to the eighth round, and in the eighth round, Ali knocked Foreman out. And, you know, some people say, well, how'd you do it? He said, well, I did the rope-a-dope. You know, I laid against the ropes, and I let him tire himself out, punching at me. And, uh, but he, the strength of Foreman was his downfall. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, uh, researchers have asked Foreman since, why do you think Ali knocked you out? Mm -hmm. He said, real simple, I entered the ring thinking that I was going to, you know, murder Ali uh, because I was stronger, I was younger. Uh, but as it turned out, he outboxed me. And in outboxing me, he mauled me <laughs> and, and knocked me out. 
And, uh, and he said, I have to live with that for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in life, I found, and I agree with you, that so often a person's weakness can become their strength. Um, it's also significant, uh, it, it, if you do a, a reading of who responded to Nehemiah and who didn't, mm -hmm. there's one no notable group of people who did not respond to the call of Nehemiah to fix the walls. They were, they're described as the notables, mm. the, 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 the nobility class. Mm -hmm. And uh, my reading of it seems to suggest that this class of people were also people who had loaned money to others. I don't know if they had official banks, but uh, the people rose up uh, against the nobles uh, to tell them that they were charging too much, too much interest. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by themselves, they could never really challenge the nobles but when together mm -hmm. they began to complain against the nobles that their money lending practices were usurious and counterproductive, the nobles uh, began to lighten up on the interest rates. Hmm. And again, you know, what Nehemiah and the people showed is that they had a strength that maybe they didn't even realize. And, but they, they had that strength mm -hmm. before Nehemiah, but it's only when Nehemiah shows up mm -hmm. that the people begin to really stand up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are some of the other lessons you find in this process that Nehemiah engaged the people in, in analyzing their strengths and their weaknesses? I think that he, um, just like he, said on the one hand, build behind your own wall. The example you gave, he also was saying to them, we can work together for a greater good. And in addition to the uh, uh, fixing your own area behind yourself, working together, we're gonna strengthen the entire community. I, I, I think he, I think he was very skillful, very strategic in terms of saying, Put one foot in front of the other for yourself, but together you form a, a family that's going to go forward and give you uh, security um, and safety. I think he was very skillful. Dr. Hotchkiss, there may be somebody looking at this program today who feels emotionally weak, emotionally not able to stand up to the pressures uh, that they have to deal with. And what quick advice would you give to a person who feels like that? I, I really, really want to um, make sure that people understand that social support, social connectedness, connectedness with a good friend, connectedness with connecting with their pastor, their spiritual leader, that social support is, is is, is just so important and so helpful. And they can, they can start with their, start there, share that burden, and that will help them go forward. Now I'm gonna muddy the water. Okay. Suppose a person reaches out to their social network, but the social network that they reach out to or some of the individuals in that network are harmful. Mm, mm. How do we, how do we even know when we look up to a pastor, we look up to a school teacher, we look up to a doctor, and we start getting advice that just doesn't sit right with us. Uh, how does the emotionally healthy person uh, figure that out? Well, you do, you pay attention to your own gut, number one. You should trust your gut and pray about it if that helps and also get a second opinion. Talk to a different friend, talk to a different pastor, I, but pay attention to your gut. Don't, don't dismiss it. If you're worried about something, there's something to be worried about. You know, I think about the Olympic, uh, United States Olympic gymnastic team, the mm -hmm. females. Mm. Uh, 
you know, with a doctor in uh, Michigan State University who took advantage of them. Uh, but they were brave enough to speak up. And uh, to me, that says a lot uh, about the character of those young women. Um, and we're talking about Nehemiah. To me, uh, the example of Nehemiah is just spectacular in terms of a person who's willing to put his career as the cupbearer to the king on hold to go home to fix the walls. And I think that there's probably somebody looking at this today who needs to go home and fix the walls of your own house. You know, sometimes it's a lot easier to want to fix somebody else's house and not your own. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. But I really have appreciated so much you taking the time to be with me. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience? When you about mental health and wellness, <laughs> <and> Nehemiah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we we've talked about uh, Nehemiah uh, being able to say, okay, this is something I'm going to do for the greater good. And when you mentioned the um, Olympic competitors, I thought you were going to mention Simone Biles. Well, she's who, part of that group. Who, but in addition, more recently, she had the courage to say, no, I'm going to stop competing right now. For a while. For a while, because I have to go home and rebuild my wall. I have to go home and take care of my mental health. And there was a lot of pressure on her to not do that. But it is okay to say sometimes, you know what? I need to take a break. I need to take care of myself because if I don't take care of myself, I can't take care of anybody else. So Dr. Hotchkiss, you've, get, you've left us with a great word and that's how we're gonna end the program today. I wanna to thank those of you who are watching. Uh, I've been talking with Dr. Linda Hotchkiss, a psychiatrist here in Detroit, Michigan. And I want you to know that emotional wellness uh, is available. And I want you to know that I am praying for you. I have somebody listening to the phone right now. If you call the phone right now, I have somebody prepared to pray for you. And I want you to know, I too am praying for you. God bless, God keep you. And I hope you'll tune in next week when we look at Nehemiah chapter six. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. God bless, God keep you. This is a new ministry which is just starting. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and his power throughout the world. If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, we ask that you mail a tax-free donation to Nicholas Hood Ministries at 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan, 48201.